Week one's finally here. Are you excited? Off the record, begins now. All right, this is episode six of Off the Record here on Nickel Press TV. Do not adjust your steps. That is actually the Lord Fedek in full Game of Thrones regalia. We are ready to begin the NFL season. Week one is finally here. Let me remind you, this might sound obvious, but don't forget to set your lineups. That is paramount. Uh, you took the time to be in all these leagues. You don't want to be the fool that forgets to set your week one lineup and immediately start out with a loss. I want to give a quick mention to some of our partners, our friends with fantasybenefits.com, fantasyassembly.com. The Lord and I have been in several places lately. We are now being uh, featured on a weekly Atlanta radio segment. So check out 920 AM, The Wave. And if you're in Atlanta, make sure you check them out on Saturdays at six o'clock. You can hear us. 6 p.m. that is, talking a little fantasy football. Different stuff than what we do on this show. And then uh, lastly, the Dream League, which Tahal is taking over, is the commissioner of, that is being featured on Rasball, so you can check that out. It's kind of like a, uh, kind of like FX is the league. Lastly, check out fantasyrundown.com and, of course, Revel Labels, although it's too late probably for this year to get your draft kits. Uh, I'm going to be posting some pictures of the draft I'm hosting that they sponsored, and you'll see why I've been uh, so adamant about you using them. Anyway, let's move on to the panel this week. On Twitter, it's just at Jackson Safon, S-A-F-O-N, last name. Uh, I cover USC football for the USC Annenberg School of Journalism at USC, so if you want specifically the USC news, you can definitely follow me. As far as fantasy goes, I write for uh, Fake Pigskin and Fake Football. I write for uh, DLF, Dynasty League Football. Uh, you can find me on there uh, for Twitter, at A Lightner. DLF, so make it nice and simple for everybody. My forte is obviously dynasty, but you know I can talk, you know, redraft every, you know, single season, all that stuff. So now I would like to share the story of how you made it on to this episode, if you don't mind. And uh, I've mentioned Ryan Berger, the FF Ghost, several times on this show, and he put together a package uh, to thank Scott Fish for all the work he does with Fantasy Cares, and put in a whole basket of uh, subscriptions to all kinds of different sites and we donated a uh basically the co-host uh, or a guest on the show for a full episode and the winner polo sprunger decided he wanted to pass it on to his favorite analyst which happens to be andrew leitner so make sure you're following him on twitter and make sure you're reading his work I, all right i gotta i gotta ask i can't i can't avoid it anymore what are we uh i i feel like you should be running along the beach in an Old Spice commercial. Andy, sometimes you need to make a change, and uh, I'm going through a few life changes. So, I mean, there's really not much more to it than that. I, you know, there's no explanation needed. I think, I think people understand me that watch this show. I think people know me, and I think they understand exactly what's going on. All right. Well, well, we'll leave it at that. So there were some changes this week, uh, more specifically with the NFL rosters being cut down and pared down to 53. Surprised by anyone that was cut this week? I was surprised the Seahawks cut Jordan Hill. He must be have a pretty serious injury. Nobody's picked him up. He had some big time sack numbers a couple of years back. He's a third round pick, always kind of a underachiever other than that one kind of breakout season. And then he got hurt before the Super Bowl anyway. So who cares? We don't need him. Uh, other than that, I was very surprised, obviously, with sitting on the Packers guard. The guy's one of the best guards in the league, allegedly. He grades out well everywhere that I've seen. He immediately gets swooped up. I'm wondering how you don't get a draft pick, or even if it's a late one for a guy who's immediately gets swooped up and gets paid seven, eight million a year or whatever he got. How is he not get? How are you not trading? They said he didn't even. They didn't even pick up the phone to see if they get a pick for him or something. That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever i'm confused and then a guy i'm not surprised who got cut is bjorn warner why was this guy ever drafted in the first round what a pathetic excuse of a gm that is running the colts they're a tragedy their whole team's garbage their roster is ass they're going to be terrible 
Well, those were all compelling arguments for three players. But when I asked the question, I was thinking more specifically like offensive players, such as Justin Forsett, Mark Sanchez, Ronnie Hillman, Kenny Bell. Forsett got picked back up, which is what everybody knew they were going to do. That's fine. The rest of these guys are bums. An offensive player. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Lightner, the uh, the dynasty guru. And Kenny Bell was like an all-season favorite of so many people. Thought he was going to break out this year with the Buccaneers. I wasn't shocked by by much of them. But, I mean, like Kenny Bell, like I had him stashed in a lot of my leagues, actually, towards the end of the bench. I like the kid coming out of college. Obviously, you know, he wasn't performing very well. I remember against the Eagles there, he he fumbled the opening kickoff that he was returning. So I didn't see much out of him. So it doesn't really surprise me too much that they cut him. Garris Garrett for the Panthers, he's another popular guy in Dynasty that people like to stash because, you know, he's got the great physical traits. And he actually, I think, I believe he led the Panthers in receiving in the preseason. So um, that was a little bit of a surprise. But maybe he's not as talented as people think that he is and just look at his physical attributes and think that he's better than what he really is. Um, but still, he's a little bit of a surprise. Uh, you mentioned Gaffney. I actually liked Gaffney. And he was another guy that I picked up in a bunch of my leagues when I saw him getting the, the carries that he was getting in New England. Plus for the fact that we all know Bill Belichick likes to toy around with everybody. So Speaking of Kiaris Garrett, uh, he actually, I'm really pulling for him. I was a big fan of his. I have spoken with him. He actually did an unaired episode. Uh, him and Spencer Drango did an unaired, uh, unaired episode of Hanging Einstein, uh, which maybe someday I'll release the footage. But we were supposed to redo it after the draft. Uh, so I'm hoping he winds up somewhere else. Moving along, we were down at the Senior Bowl, and we had heated debates about Carson Wentz. I personally thought that once Bradford was traded, they were going to go with Chase Daniel with the money that they paid him. And I personally like Chase Daniel, but I, it's not really too surprising with the value of quarterbacks and the value of these picks. The teams really want to get them out right away. He likes to lock on to receivers. He's big, he's fast, he's got a big arm, and so he, so he does flash with some, with some of his deep throws. But he just doesn't have nearly what it, the whole package that it takes to be an NFL quarterback right now. So, But because he likes to take shots and has that big arm, he's going to make some big plays, but he's also going to make a lot of mistakes. Yeah. I'm highly confused. Why? One, they said, first off, this guy's sitting all year, basically, is the first thing. Then he gets his rib broken or whatever, bruised, and he hasn't played a snap of the preseason. Then, then they gave my boy Chase Daniel, who I've been begging for a chance to start for multiple years now. Nobody understands. Nobody gets it. This guy could be solid. Denver should have picked him up. Somebody should have picked this guy up. I wish he had a chance to start. I thought he was going to get it now that they traded bum-ass Sam Bradford, the most overrated player, overvalued player in NFL history. And then and now Daniel, they want to pay him this money, and then they're going to start a guy who hasn't even done anything yet at all and they're saying needs a, a year to wait like i'm highly confused i think the eagles are going to be terrible i think wentz has a horrible receiving core and i just i'm just not feeling it i'm not feeling it i don't understand it i'm upset and hurt that chase daniel is not being given the shot what's he doing there why aren't they trade him too so you're calling uh jordan matthews and zach Ertz both horrible yeah, and let's not forget Doyle Green Beckham. That receiving core is sneaky pretty good. And former USC Trojan Nelson Aguilar. Garbage. Aguilar looks just to me, it looks like the definition of average. I'm trying to figure out how this guy went in the first round now. Like, I'm looking at this guy, like, what does this guy do better than what is his, like, is he overly fast? No. Is he a great hand? No. Let me, let me get back to my other question. Did you just really call Jordan Matthews and Zach Ertz terrible? Did you watch Jordan? I, are you being sarcastic? Did you watch Jordan Matthews last year? I thought he was one of the more disappointing players in fantasy football last year. I've kind of lost track of what he's doing in life these days. Yeah, I just recently had a debate with, uh, I forgot who, on Twitter over Jordan Matthews. I personally think you look at the numbers. He's going into his third year. He's put up eight touchdowns each of his first two seasons. He's approached, uh, what was it, 90 receptions at one point. He's thousand yard guy I don't think he's underperformed I think people have kind of over expected when it comes to Jordan Matthews but that's just my own personal feeling I'm still a Jordan Matthews fan I'm more concerned uh, confused by the Earth comment because a lot of people have him pegged as a top five breakout tight end this year so 
Uh, when you said the whole receiving core around Wentz was horrible, it kind of made I me. Meant, I meant, obviously, I meant wide receiver core. Okay. I apologize for not clarifying that for you. It didn't like four of those touchdowns Matthews got last year came in like one game or something. Like, I'm confused. Like, I think he finally had like a decent run some point late in the season, but he was trash early. That's all I remember. Yeah, he had uh he had four games that you could pretty much write off, and then twelve out of sixteen that were pretty good for fantasy. Only a couple of those were at the last couple of weeks of the season when it doesn't really matter for fantasy. So as a fantasy owner, yes, it, it was a little underwhelming. But all in all, if he's your third receiver, that's not too bad. This originally started out with the Carson Wentz argument. Are you looking at him as a long term guy in fantasy and dynasty leagues in particular? I'd say long term, I'm, if we're talking about dynasty, and this is clarifying for one QB leagues, not super flex. Yes. But um, for one QB leagues, I would probably pick Dak Prescott. And before you know, I get any backlash for doing that. Although I know, I think you're a Prescott fan down there. Yeah, I but, think um, we all are. <laughs> I think. I well, see, for me, it's not so much. That I think he's he might be the best quarterback out of the bunch, but for fantasy wise. Um, him having the rushing ability that he does as well as the situation that's surrounding him, I would much rather have him both in the short term and probably the long term than a guy like Carson Wentz. I don't put a whole lot of emphasis in my quarterbacks when it comes to my leagues only because um, that's one position where you can get by with mostly anybody because the point differential from week to week, you're not getting a big point differential there between. The, any of the mid-tier guys, it's only you're only talking one or two points a week of an advantage. So for me, I've always been a guy where I wait on my quarterbacks and then I pretty much play matchups with two guys rather than pay the premium price for one of the stud quarterbacks. I've said this recently. He kind of reminds me of Russell Wilson when I watch him play. So uh, you being a big Seahawk fan, was that something that you saw too? Was that why you seem to be kind of excited about Dak? Well, I, I think that's a little bit aggressive and generous to compare him to Russell Wilson. But I, I will say that at the Senior Bowl when we went, partially it's because I had very low expectations for Prescott and everyone seemed to have high expectations for Wentz. But I thought that Prescott looked much better than Wentz compared to all the hype. Like I, I wasn't really expecting much, but he, he played pretty well, arguably as good as any of the quarterbacks at the Senior Bowl. And like Andrew said, the situation is obviously excellent with Zeke, that offensive line. We still have Dez and Witten. So this it's it's the, I don't think it's going to necessarily be a guy you can it's really worth rostering and redraft as far as if you're playing in one quarterback leagues but for the future and if you're in two quarterback leagues I think he's got some potential play for sure I'm a big deck fan man I like him fantasy wise he's going to run it a little bit I, I think he's going to be pretty I think he I'm leaning towards I'm not really been making any prediction on him but I'm leaning towards him having a lot of success like he looked great in the preseason he, I, I was just surprised at the way he's able to throw the ball. I mean, obviously, he's a great college player. A lot of the time, those guys don't seem to quite have it in the uh, pros, can't make all the throws. But to me, he looked pretty good, man. I mean, he he, and he, ran, he can run the ball, which is obviously in fantasy, is huge for the quarterback. So I think he's going to be fine. I think I got him ranked on fantasy pros a little higher than the consensus in week one. I think he's going to be okay, mostly because I think he's going to run a little bit. And uh, I like him. Yeah, he didn't seem to be doing anything accidentally in the preseason. And the right. uh, Russell Wilson comparison uh, is very premature. Obviously, like you mentioned, it's a little aggressive. I just meant more in terms of style of play, um, poise, arm strength. African-American. Uh, ability, extending plays. Um, I, I just meant in that regard more than anything. So we'll see. It's a long ways off. All right. Well, now it is time for us to bring in the fantasy doctor, Dr. Selim Parekh of Duke University fame, of course. Uh, let's start with uh, Jamal Charles, as I mentioned, probably the biggest name. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. of people were drafting him very early, thinking he was 100% back to being himself. No, far from it. Listen, you know, whenever you have a second ACL reconstruction, it's a longer timeline. He's about 11 months out from his second ACL reconstruction. Uh, Andy Reid's already uh, voiced concern that he may not be uh, available game one. I think that even if he does play, it's going to be very few reps. I don't think you're going to see much out of him. Um, my gut feeling is we're not seeing him till late September, if not into October. So 
Hopefully we'll see him back. The timeline is not worrisome to me yet, but it come late October, if you don't see him on the playing field, then I get worried that he may not be back this season or ever at all because you worry about that second ACL. You worry about his ability to run, to cut, and to have the agility needed to be an NFL running back. And so um, I'm not really worried till the end of October. Because last week we were talking heavily about Kenny Stills and Devontae Parker. Uh, which was going to emerge, you uh, shook your head about Kenny Stills' back injury, saying it was nothing to really worry about. I'm assuming that's the case, but uh, Devontae Parker, not one but two hamstring injuries. Is this something that we should be concerned about this season? So for Stills, I don't think there's anything to worry about. It looks like a back strain. I think he's going to be good to go week one. Devontae Parker, two hamstring injuries. Hamstrings are one of those things that if you don't give it the time it needs to recover, these things are going to nag him all season long. So um, even if he's available week one, I think you'll see limited reps on him. I think week two, week three, he'll be much better. But look for the Dolphins to kind of take it slow with him. they got to give him the time he needs to rest this thing and to recover before getting, get, getting down field full throttle. Okay, so this is going to be like his rookie season all over again. Yeah, pretty much. Tyler Gaffney. Uh, looked like he might have a role with the Patriots on early downs, then uh, was cut, re-signed. Now I believe he's on the pup list. Uh, yeah. What is his outlook going forward for Dynasty Leaguers? Yeah, so he obviously had a great preseason, uh, injured it in game four of the preseason. The specific uh, details of his injuries is unclear. I've heard things from the uh, a sprain in the middle part of the foot to a fracture at the base of the, the fifth metatarsal. So if you look at the bone here, if that's your, your fifth toe, uh, the base of that of that bone is called a metatarsal and, and supposedly has a break of that base. It's different than a Jones fracture, which is why it does not need surgery. Um, but if he has it, he's really weak to weak. And so obviously uh, four to six weeks is my timeline on him, although it really is weak to weak. And when the pain's better, he'll be good to go. And then uh, finally, some week one statuses of some big names. Julio yep. Jones, what, what's your outlook for him week one? Julio Jones sounds like an ankle sprain preseason game three. I think he's going to be good. Thomas Rawls. Rawls, uh, obviously preseason uh, game four. He really kind of forced himself into the game. He looked pretty good. I think the, the Seahawks are going to be slow on him, though, because he pushed him too fast too soon. He he can get a setback of having uh, pain and inflammation in that in that ankle. So look for him to see playing time. He's not listed as actually the the starter for for the first game, but that obviously can switch if he has a good week this week in, in practice. But I think even if he's, he starts, he's gonna have limited reps. Our last one second with the Seahawks, Jimmy Graham. Yeah, so Graham, you know, hasn't played any preseason games. A patellar tendon injury is a big injury. I, I don't think you're going to see him in really great form until the middle of October. Now, you, you hear word coming out of Seattle camp that he's practicing great. He looks great in practice. But at the end of the day, practice preseason games are all different than the real season. And I just think uh, middle of October is kind of my gut feeling on timeline for him. Just one final footnote on the uh, Seahawks. Alex Collins did make the final 53-man roster. So, yes, I just wanted to make no- note of that. Keenan Allen who is Jackson's favorite player this my guy. season. Uh, I should mention that leading up into this episode, we were kind of doing uh, favorites and sleepers and busts for draft reasons. Now that the season's about to start, it's unlikely that this is going to help you too much towards that end. There are, will be some of you still drafting today and tomorrow. Uh, so this can also be just applied just to the season in general. Maybe you missed out. Maybe you already had your draft. And now you're going to try to swing a week one, a week two trade based on something you hear in this episode. So, as I mentioned, Jackson's favorite player this season, wide receiver Keenan Allen, San Diego Chargers. When I say my favorite player, it's probably based on ADP because his ADP right now is 21st at 209, according to the FF calculator. I just think that's that's stealing if you could get him there. Because before he got hurt last year, he was the sixth best receiver in PPR in terms of points per game and he was just targeted so much he, he really took the leap he had a great rookie season and sort of a disappointing sophomore season and last year he really looked like he took the leap and really was he was always open he's Philip Rivers favorite guy and they're just gonna they they didn't really improve all that much defensively so I expect them to still throw a lot they they pretty sure they led the league in attempts last year or were in the, in the top three at least 
and the, they should be right back up there again. And Keenan Allen's gonna gonna be the guy that Rivers just targets over and over and over. He he's one of the outside. If I had to say a dark horse guy to lead the league in receptions outside of Antonio and Julio, mm-hmm. I would say that Keenan Allen might be third on my list there. I mean, he's going pretty high. I mean, I twenty for I, in my in most of my drafts I've done be, so far, he's gone higher than that. Um, he's gone kind of early second round, I would say, early to mid second round. So he's gone a little bit higher than that for me. So I haven't really seen him. And, uh, yeah, he's just going to get targeted all day long. I mean, what else they got there? The, everything else there is gross, as usual. They didn't do anything else exciting. I don't like the Chargers roster at all. I thought they should have blown it up a few years back, but they somehow made the playoffs with McCoy that one year when I thought they were garbage. I thought they needed a total rebuild. They didn't do that. Now they're paying the price because they're just a total mediocre football team. I don't think there's anything going on there. Uh, no no kind of title potential there. So I'm not sure what they're doing. But, uh, yeah, Keenan Allen should rack up the stats. Antonio Gates is older than dirt. And, uh, yeah, there's nothing else there. So he should receive, like he said, you know, top three, four targets in the league. That would that would be shocking to me if he did not, other unless injured. Unless injured. In a year that – the tight end really seems to be a very hard position to predict uh, outside of maybe one guy and one guy only. Vance McDonald, can he be top five at the position? Uh, top five, maybe not top five, but, you know, it's interesting because at the beginning of the offseason, it actually, the tight end position looked like it was going to be more on the optimistic side because you had guys like Ladarius Green, now he's hurt, so, you know, we don't really know what's going on with him. Um, Kobe Fleener's another popular one, obviously. Um, but we seem to have, like, this second tier of guys that it looked like the, the position was getting better. Now, again, you have Bronk and Jordan Reed, if he stays healthy, and then, you know, some a couple of the other guys. But then it's pretty much Flynn Pickens from there. So the reason I like Vance McDonald is pretty much the situation that he has in front of him. Once Bruce Ellington went down, which was a popular choice for a sleeper with that team, uh, I know a lot of people were talking about him on Twitter and stuff and in the Dynasty community as because he played in the slot and Jordan Matthews obviously played in the slot in Chip Kelly's system. But without Ellington there, you pretty much have Torrey Smith and a bunch of no-names or unproven guys at wide receiver. I mean, the Niners, plain and simple, they're just not good. Obviously, Chip Kelly likes to run that fast pace and, you know, he loves – making a ton of plays as far as the number of plays that he runs for me it's more the opportunity of Vance McDonald I think he's going to get a lot of garbage time points this year because they're going to get they're going to be down a lot this year they're going to have to abandon the run a lot of times because they're going to be getting blown out and we also seen a rapport with Blaine Gabbert and Vance McDonald in the preseason and also if you look back at Vance McDonald last year I believe it was four out of the last six weeks of the regular season he scored double digit fantasy points so he did show some promise there. And also people forget that he was actually a second round pick in the NFL. So the kid's got some talent. It's not like he's just some scrub that, you know, all of a sudden he's coming out of nowhere. And I not that I love Vance McDonald, but it's obvious that once Blaine Gabbert, you know, one of the bigger busts of all time, took over the quarterback job, that he seems to they seem to have a connection because as soon as he took over, he started getting loose. Kaepernick obviously never looked his way at all. He can't see down the field. He can't make any decisions with his life. I'm not sure what he's doing. But Gabbert, the one thing I saw him do in the preseason is lock on tight ends. He doesn't seem to be able to throw to wide receivers, which is why I'm confused. We have people on every week who want to talk about Torrey Smith being some great sleeper and this and that. It still doesn't make sense to me, even though I find myself following their advice, drafting him late because these guys supposed experts keep telling me he's going to blow up this year. And I'm the biggest Torrey Smith fan there is, but I just don't see it. Gabbert seems to lock on on tight ends. McDonald has been doing well. Every game he's played almost with Gabbert, he balled out at the end of last year. He's going off in the preseason. I have him ranked higher in uh, fantasy pros this week probably than just about anybody. So I'm fully on board, and I would like a player that I disagree with. Okay, well, let's see if you disagree with this one. We're going to go to Jackson sleeper real quick, and that's Frank Gore. Uh, I suppose he's a sleeper just because he's going so, so late, and they're so ridiculously weak at the running back position, almost almost 
mind-blowingly weak. I mean, it's it's really disgusting. I actually profiled why I think Gore's a sleeper in my All Sleeper Team uh, article on Fake Football. I'm gonna plug my own my own piece there, but since since I wrote the article, he's bumped up. Now he's being taken in the middle of the sixth round, which I still think is too late. Last year he was running back 14, but in a season when Andrew Luck only played half of the games. So it's just, if Luck can come back and help boost the whole offense which people seem to think is going to happen with T.Y. Hilton, Dante Moncrief, and Dwayne Allen. I'm not sure why Gore wouldn't be able to be the beneficiary of that as well. And Gore, while he's he's old, he's been extremely healthy the last few seasons. He's played four, four 16-game seasons in a row, I believe. And last year, he also is a, he's a guy who's never really fumbled a lot over the history of his career. But last year, he had two sort of inexplicable fumbles at the goal line. If he doesn't fumble those and takes us into the end zone, He's the running back 10 on the season last year. He would have been an RB1. We were talking about him a little while ago. Uh, Andrew has Jordan Matthews down as a guy. He absolutely hates the season. Between Bradford or Wentz, it actually, in a way, it might make it a little bit worse with Wentz. Um, at least with Bradford, you know, he had him there last year. So, you know, maybe they had a little bit of a rapport there. Now we're starting brand new with another quarterback and, so it might be a little bit worse even if I had to choose, but I wouldn't say that it it really varies too much between Brad. I don't think Bradford's any good either. So if you look at his totals over his first few years, he's one of five players to have 150 receptions, 1,800 yards, and 16 touchdowns in his first two seasons. The other four are Odell, AJ Green, Marcus Colston, and Larry Fitzgerald. That sounds like Canton to me. So, <laughs> Mr. Leitner, why are you hating? On my man, J Matt. Well, actually, for one, he actually hasn't had a thousand yard season yet. He was just short of it last two seasons. But I will give you, he had 85 catches last year. Um, for me, the whole thing with him is I think a lot of it was built in on Chip Kelly's system. I think helped him out more than himself. Um, if you look at his numbers the last two seasons, he's actually played a larger percentage of the snaps out of the slot than any receiver in the NFL. I think it was like 98% or something like that. Supposedly they tried him out on the outside in training camp, and Doug Peterson's even admitted that it didn't go very well. It's not so much a knock on Matthews as it is that I think his numbers were propped up a lot based on Chip Kelly's system. You're going from Chip Kelly's system, which was predominantly a three wide receiver set. Now you're going to a more traditional with Doug Peterson where he does his base offense isn't going to be a three three wide receiver set. For me, it's not that I hate him in terms of I don't think he's going to be productive at all. It's more of I think his name and what he's done the past two seasons, like you've been saying, I think prop his value up higher than where it should be. Yeah, this just sounds like more lobbying for Torrey Smith. He should technically get a ton of targets over there. I mean, what else are they working with here? I mean, I hope my boy DGB gets up in the action. I'd love to see that. Do I think he'll be solid? Sure. Top 25 wide receiver, Jordan Matthews. That's my. Uh, that's what I'm going with. A lot of people are excited that Chip Kelly's there now, thinking that that will rejuvenate Carlos Hyde's career. You seem to not think so. Uh, yeah, I think um, for basically all the reasons I use to support Vance McDonald are the same reasons that go against Carlos Hyde. From that aspect, it's going to be hard game from week to week to be able to trust Carlos Hyde getting enough touches um, because of the fact that they're going to be playing from behind so much. On top of it, when you're talking PPR, Carlos Hyde hasn't really shown much as far as being able to contribute out of the backfield catching passes. With Carlos Hyde, it's not so much that I don't like his talent. I just think that team's absolutely terrible. On top of it, you look at who they play in their division. You got two games against the Seahawks, two games against the Cardinals, and people want to laugh at the Rams, but their front seven's pretty solid as well. So right there, you're talking almost a third of your season playing against defenses. You're not going to trust Carlos Hyde to going up against. Hey, I'd love to have him on the Seahawks. I think overall talent-wise, he's a superior running back to Thomas Rawls. I have no doubt about that. It's like he said, though, you know, what's the offense going to be like? I'm, I'm a big Hyde fan. I'm probably a bigger fan of his than most people are to a degree. I think he passes the eye test. I think he has elite talent at running back but he's been banged up constantly and uh 49ers have been projected the least amount of wins in the nfl on multiple sites i've used and uh you know i think it's going to be a rough year for them i think he's going to get a lot of usage though i mean we'll see i mean i think their defense is actually going to be pretty solid 
and that might keep them in more games than people are thinking. So maybe they won't be trailing like by huge amounts, like like we're thinking it's going to happen. But you know, I'm a little I'm higher on them than most. But again, you, you do make a great point against going against the Cardinals, going against the Seahawks. You know what? In the, I guess the Rams is a tough one, man. It's a tough sled. It's a tough spot for him to be in. I love the talent, though. I'm not going to lie to you. Let's keep it out west. Then our last player on this week's agenda, and that is Amari Cooper. Yeah, yeah, why not, man? They looked great, and then he had some foot problems that kind of obviously slowed him down as he kind of just disappeared there at the end of the season or near the at the bottom third of the season or maybe almost the second half of the season. He became almost non-existent on a couple games. And I'm going to give him benefit of the doubt and blame some of the injury for that. And then I, I think he's going to find – I mean, why wouldn't he develop a little bit? I mean, he looked great early on. I think I think he's going to improve, no question. You're going against the the host of this show with this. You better you better have a good reason why you hate Amari Cooper this year. Well, well, I got my first Amari Cooper dynasty shared this off season, so it's not like I'm not a believer in the talent or the guy. Just where he's going this year is pretty questionable to me. He's currently being drafted as the 12th receiver off the board, and last year he was the 28th receiver on a points per game basis. Well, obviously, if you're drafting him this year that highly, you're expecting something to change, you're expecting him to progress as a player, car to improve, or you're expecting Crabtree's targets to go down, which I don't see happening. I, I think Crabtree's been a guy who's, in every offense he's been, when he's been healthy, he's been relatively consistently featured. So maybe Cooper's targets go up a little bit, but I also think the Raiders are going to be a little bit better than they were in years in last year. So they might run the ball a little more, not pass the ball quite as much, which could bevy and keep Cooper's targets low. And the other problem that people love to mention with Cooper that I completely agree with is his red zone lack of red zone targets. He only had seven targets in the red zone all of last season and none inside the 10-yard line. Well, that'll probably change, but it's still just enough. That needs to be a lot higher for a guy for a guy like that and to be drafting as a top-12 receiver. Fair enough. Although like I, I said, I own him in Dynasty now, so I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful he takes the lead. Is it time to start targeting running backs early again? As far as the zero running back thing goes, obviously it's more popular than ever after the running back downturn continued last year. I'm not necessarily saying I disagree with the zero running back theorem. I think the numbers really prove that in PPR leagues, receivers are the safer bet. I'm just curious to see if there's some sort of rebound because we have seen like a trailing off pattern with running back scoring. The last year was definitely a dip from that trend. So it's either going to be continuing on a more aggressive downturn or, it's only, or it, might, it might go back up towards the trend line, which would be actually an increase from last year. But I'm just a little bit curious to see if those top running backs uh, bust as much as they did last year. But as far as uh, myself, you can follow me on Twitter, at Jackson Safon. A lot of USC football content has been fantasy-wise. I'll be having a weekly, weekly story on fake football. So, yeah, take a look and hit me up on Twitter. Excellent. Excellent stuff. And uh, definitely uh, be checking out Jackson on Twitter and following his, uh, his work and his career. He's going to be a fast riser. Uh, I've seen it personally firsthand for myself, the uh, respect this guy's commanding from some, some veterans in the – journalism world but Andrew it's been a pleasure to get to meet you to get to know you a little bit better this week uh I can understand why Polo Sprunger is so sprung on you uh so why don't you go ahead and tell everybody how they can find you as well and how good is this Colts offense really and you can find me at uh, dynastyleaguefootball.com uh that's who I write for and then my Twitter handle is at a lightner dlf um pretty simple but um my big concern with the Colts offense, because, you know, everybody's picking all these guys to rebound and have great years again because Luck's back in the fold with T.Y. Hilton and Moncrief's a super popular guy in Dynasty and Redraft. I even drafted him in my Redraft League. So um, Dwayne Allen, now that Kobe Fleener's gone. Jackson mentioned Frank Gore. Um, but my big concern is their offensive line. We saw Luck get hurt last year because they couldn't protect him, and it looks like we could be going down a similar path. Yes, I think with luck there, they're going to obviously all be a lot better. Um, but my, it scares me to death thinking that they can keep him healthy for a whole 16 games with that offensive line. Maybe we need to pump the brakes a little bit as far as picking the Colts as being this um, juggernaut offense. The Dante Moncrief spike, I think that is referred to as the Matt Harmon effect. Uh, same applies for Tyler Lockett. Same applies for I'm forgetting the uh, 
another guy who was big on uh, in the last couple of weeks. But anyway, uh, I appreciate you guys jumping on with us this week. Hope you guys had as much fun as we did. Sure. I'm going to refer to uh, Rapunzel real quick before we wrap things up and ask, is there anything you'd like to leave the world with? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. It's been a wild week, a rough week for me. Hopefully I come back next week stronger than ever. Hopefully I come back at all. Okay. Well, you can check us out. Uh, in addition to Off the Record, as I mentioned, on 9.20 a.m. The Wave. Uh, you can find that on the web. Or if you're in Atlanta, you can listen live. Uh, also, make sure to check out Friends with Fantasy Benefits, FantasyAssembly.com, Revel Labels. As I mentioned also earlier, Ted Hall is the commissioner of the Dream League, which is a takeoff of the league featured on Razball.com. So, week one is here. Set your lineups. Hope you had a good time. Hope you uh, learned something that you didn't know 30 minutes ago. And we'll see you next week. Enjoy. Thank you.